Our final speaker today is Mark Klintberg. <coughs> He's an artist and an art his <coughs> excuse me, an art historian. He is currently an assistant professor in the Department of Art History at Concordia University, where he completed his PhD in 2013. In 2010, he conducted a portion of his research at Oxford University, St. Peter's College, with the support of the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council. In 2013, he was shortlisted for the Sobe Art Award. Journals and periodicals that have published his writing include Sense and Society, C Magazine, etc., Backflash, Canadian Art, The Art Newspaper, Border Crossings, The Philip Review, and Arts Magazine. He has forthcoming book chapters and edited collections published by Easy Books, focusing on Ruli artists' multiples, by Bloomsbury on the historic de denigration and recent celebration of the sense of taste in museum practice, and by the University of Toronto Press on the operation of museum-based restaurants in exhibition sites. The title of the paper Mark is presenting today is Passion Over Reason, Joyce Wheeland, Margaret Trudeau, and Fogo Island. Please welcome Mark. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to start off by thanking Amandina for organizing and chairing this session and also thanking Kwahi for putting together this incredible conference. I'm really delighted to be here. Joyce Wheeland was a Canadian artist, an experimental filmmaker, a feminist, and an activist. Her work is known for its frank and playful treatment of eroticism, gender, and patriotism, as well as her, her frequent use of text, image, crafted from materials like cotton, plastic, and vinyl. <coughs> Margaret Trudeau, née Sinclair, is an author, actor, and formerly uh, the Canada's first lady, wed to former Prime Minister Pierre Elliott Trudeau. She gained a reputation as a strong-willed and intelligent public figure. Who would have guessed that these two women would be unwitting collaborators, conspirators, at a distance in disassembling the political slogan, the political message of one of Canada's most charismatic and controversial leaders through an artwork with which they all three had contact. This paper focuses on three moments to explore women's interventions into masculine political discourse using artwork as a fulcrum. The first moment is connected to the legacy and context of Whelan's quilted artworks Reason Over Passion from 1968, and also La Raison Avant la Passion, also from 1968, two wall hangings that use the intimate associations of the quilting medium to subtly shift the words of Pierre Trudeau, who of course claimed that reason over passion was the theme of all of his writings. The second moment involves an alteration of Whelan's project, by Margaret Trudeau in the mid-1970s, an act that further modified her husband's slogan. And those of you who know the story, please, no spoilers. The third moment of intervention is in 2014, whoops, when I worked with a group of 17 women living on Fogo Island to craft a kind of homage to Whelan's practice, and also, I would say, to Margaret Trudeau's intervention. I'm pursuing this research because I'm interested in the long-term affective and material outcomes of artworks. And I'm particularly attracted to feminist and queer strategies of disorder to upset rationality and its connections to nationhood. I suggest that the affective dimension of these artworks and their role in the lives of these two women and their role in our lives today uh, which can involve a combination of ardor and frustration for patriotism and for Trudeau's phrase, can be meaningfully understood through the lens of affect theory proposed by Sarah Ahmed in her book, The Promise of Happiness. <coughs> in this book, Ahmed introduces the allegorical yet very real figure of the feminist killjoy, a specter <laughs> that raises hostile and shameful emotions by highlighting patriarchy in otherwise joyful, happy atmospheres ruled by dominant values and politics. 
This is a type of feminist haunting for Ahmed. Uh, and it inspires the phrase, she believes, I'm not a feminist, but, which <laughs> she finds to be a very limiting phrase. And Ahmed writes on the figure of the feminist killjoy, quote, does the feminist kill, kill other people's joy by pointing out moments of sexism? Or does she expose the bad feelings that get hidden, displaced, or negated under public signs of joy? Whelan's series of work, uh, Reason Over Passion and La Raison Avant la Passion, is an indictment against the continual disappointments associated with patriarchic structures that kill joy, including its manifestations in government. The feminist is not the problem. Patriarchy is the problem. Similarly, Whelan's and Margaret Trudeau's interventions in Pierre Trudeau's political slogan expose hidden feelings of passion that linger behind masculine claims for rationality. Because, of course, if you followed Pierre Trudeau's personal life, you know that he had many passionate affairs. <laughs> I want to propose this indictment in keeping with Christy A. Holmes' text focused on Wieland and artwork by women in the 1960s and also the notion of Canada as a process. So Holmes suggests, quote, perhaps we should be examining the ways in which women had to consistently negotiate their position in relation to liberalism, capitalism, and patriarchy. And that's part of what I want to do today. Although Whelan's work explores patriotism by highlighting many icons of Canadian national identity, I want to point out that her relationship with Trudeau's leadership and his alleged rationality was far from happy in the long run. Her work gives evidence of a questioning relationship of how nationhood is implemented through government. Now today it's of special importance to revisit reason over passion for at least two additional reasons, and I'm sure that you can anticipate at least one of them. First, because today, of course, we see the continuation of the Trudeau dynasty and a modified version of Trudeau mania in the person and media spin surrounding none other than liberal leader Justin Trudeau. Second, because of a revitalized interest in Joyce Whelan's legacy as expressed by a new generation of Canadian artists, uh, including myself, as well as Louis Jacob, Hazel Meyer, <laughs> uh, also collaborative work by Anthea Black, Wednesday Lupicu, and Nicole Burrish. So at least these artists and several others that I've encountered recently, young contemporary artists, are re refashioning uh, Trudeau works or replying to them. Joyce Wieland lived in New York City with her then husband, Michael Snow, between 1962 and 1971, when she returned to Canada and lived in Toronto until her untimely death in 1998. While living in New York, they had a loft in Tribeca, and it was a site known for hospitality, perhaps especially for Canadians, expats, and tourists alike. Now, in 1968, Trudeau mania was in full swing, even in New York City. Although living in the United States, Wieland nonetheless, at one point, appears to have celebrated the possibilities that this man presented for Canadian politics. During her time living abroad, Wieland maintained active ties with the Canadian art scene and was frequently back in the country for exhibitions and screenings of her work. And we know that while visiting Ottawa in 1968, Wieland had the chance to film Trudeau during the Liberal Convention on April 6th. In fact, she was right in front with the press, just a few feet away from him with her camera. And she used this footage in her film, Reason Over Passion, which was created between 1967 and 1969. This film splices together footage of a hand-drawn Canadian flag and grainy images of Canadian landscape, highway, and images shot from uh, moving modes of transportation, including the train. In fact, on my voyage here, I couldn't help but think many of us have retraced the voyage that Joyce Whelan did to make, uh, to make this very film. Working with Hollis Frampton, 
Wieland created subtitles for the film that included 537 permutations on the arrangement of the letters in the phrase reason over passion, of course, attributed to Pierre Trudeau, which appears over top of the Canadian landscape. It also it appears upside down at some points, incidentally. So it's not just disordered in terms of the ordering of the letters, but also uh, created upside down. On May 21st, 1968, Wieland hosted several Canadian expatriate women for a quilting bee at her home in Tribeca to create a quilt as a gift for Pierre Trudeau that featured his political slogan in appliqued letters. He had been elected Prime Minister of Canada just one month earlier on April 20th, 1968. This quilt was a French translation of Reason Over Passion, which the National Gallery uh, of Canada had acquired earlier that same year. Now, this was not the first time that Wieland had worked collaboratively. She had worked closely with other women to create many of her projects. She'd worked with her sister, Joan Stewart, as well as Jane Cowan and Valerie McMillan. Wieland's fascination with Trudeau continued well beyond this quilting bee. In 1969, she decided to host a loft party for Pierre Trudeau with him as the guest of honor, uh, an idea that Michael Snow was initially not very thrilled with. Why that guy? In 1969, this party had, had uh, become legendary for its glamour and also for its live jazz music. It took place on November 8th, and some of you might be wondering, oh, well, was Margaret Trudeau there, was, you know, Margaret Sinclair? No, Pierre Trudeau was dating none other than Barbara Streisand <laughs> at the time. What role does passion play in this practice? Hugo McPherson highlights Whelan's use of heart shapes in these two quilts, as well as her depiction of genitals, hearts, and flowers in her other work. And of course, the cake celebrating uh, themes of national landscape Arctic Passion Cake has the word passion in its title alone. And then there are lips, many lips in Joyce Whelan's practice. However, the objects of Whelan's passion really need to be clarified here. Although she was a Trudeau supporter early in his candidacy for the liberal leadership, she eventually lost faith in his politics, even as she retained an, in an intense passion for Canada itself, or perhaps I should say in following her, uh, Canada herself, because of course she believed that Canada was female. When she and Hollis Frampton spoke in 1971 in an interview about Trudeau, uh, Wieland asked herself, quote, was this guy Trudeau a man, an intellectual, who seemingly didn't want power, or was he acting like he didn't want power? And her rhetorical question in 1971 implies that her opinion of his politics had radically shifted. She said this after, uh, of course, the October crisis in Oct October of 1970, and therefore after Trudeau had implemented the War Measures Act. So that's just something to keep in mind, one of many factors that may have influenced her point of view. Frampton then asked Wieland what her opinion of Trudeau was after the fact, and her reply was, I feel that he's not as much concerned and impassioned about Canada as I thought. I am the one who is. So she really took it on as her mantle to be passionate about Canada. Her use of Trudeau's phrase in this film and also in these quilts has been dominantly read as ironic. Cass Banning claims that this work, quote, accentuates the rhetoric of nationalism through distortion and juxtaposition of text and image, end quote. And also that Wieland, quote, is putting him on for his enlightenment-like overvaluation of reason, end quote. And Christine Connolly explains that Wieland's project here was to, quote, render the words of the leader nonsensical by scrambling them. So was disorder important for Wieland? I think that we have a suggestion that it was. And I think that we need to recall that she also went on record saying that while she was in her editing process for Reason Over Passion, that she smoked marijuana daily uh, as a way of getting into the editing groove. So clearly, altered states influenced her reordering of this phrase. 
uh, and also reordering of the footage. But nonetheless, I want to uh, fundamentally argue that this scrambling that inflects Trudeau's phrase uh, to the point of illegibility suggests far more than substance use and altered states, uh, but rather that at the time that she was finishing her edit of the film in 1969, her attitude toward him and his slogan and its solvency was already increasingly critical. So shortly after her return to live in Canada in 1971, she was the first living woman to have a solo exhibition at the National Gallery of Canada in Ottawa. And she's just on the edge of our dates for Kwahi for that reason. Uh, the show was titled True Love, uh, pardon me, True Patriot Love, Véritable Amour Patriotique. But not everyone received Whelan's exhibition with praise. Uh, it included this, this work, incidentally. Not everyone received Whelan's exhibition with praise. The day of the opening, a group of protesters arrived on site uh, and called for the Canada Council to stop supporting Canadian expatriates who lived in the United States. Of course, she, this is a protest referring to Michael Snow and Joyce Whelan, uh, among others. Others considered the exhibition to either be too sentimental or plain propagandistic because of its treatment of the Canadian flag and other icons of Canadian identity. And one reviewer negatively referred to her works, including this one, as great quilted billboards. The film Passion Over Reason also provoked negative responses. In 1971, Wieland explained that, quote, people have hissed when Trudeau's statement comes on and the applause begins because they don't understand that there is an irony in that, that is, in her use of this phrase. George Lelis cites Manny Farber's Art Forum Review of 1970, which describes this work, quote, as an ode to Trudeau, end quote, I think really missing the point. But this conclusion is questionable since, as Joanne Sloan's research reveals, Whelan had been fully immersed in the Canadian New Left movement at this time, and in particular, the New Democratic offshoot Waffle Caucus. And as evidence of that, we just need to note that it was Mel Watkins, the leader of the Waffle Party, who was invited as the political guest of honor to her opening at the National Gallery of Canada, not Pierre Trudeau. <laughs> Wieland herself questioned if her film was a form of propaganda, asking, and I think also questioning whether the quilts themselves were a form, could be seen as a form of propaganda. And she asks the rhetorical question, what if I was Leni Reifenstahl? Of course, referring to the German director of the Nazi nationalist film, Triumph of the Will. This rhetorical question's melodramatic edge, very Joyce Wieland, uh, in fact suggests that she was concerned with how her film might be instrumentalized or misunderstood as propaganda. However, eventually it became obvious that, as Bruce Elder puts it, Joyce Wieland and Trudeau were natural antagonists. That's a quote from him. Elder concludes that the quilts and the film can, quote, be considered an emotional deconstruction of Trudeau's capsule summary of his social philosophy. Elder suggests that Wieland's chosen vehicles for the slogan, fabric quilts, have associations with lovemaking and dreaming and are thus contra-rational. I mean, who invites rationality into the bedroom? Yet with Trudeau's 1967 maxim that, quote, there's no place for the state in the bedrooms of the nation, end quote, in direct reference to the government's policies on homosexuality, the bedroom implications of Whelan's practice and the adaptation of Trudeau's slogan take on even greater significance, I would say. Margaret Joan Sinclair and Pierre Trudeau, then Justice Minister of Canada, met by chance on the Tahitian island of Moria while they were on separate vacations. Shortly thereafter, she saw Trudeau again at the Liberal Convention of 1968, where Joyce Wieland was capturing her footage for the film Reason Over Passion. So this is an incident where we see these two historical figures encountering Trudeau and his legacy. The convention was a mob of spirited supporters, many of them in miniskirts, who thronged Trudeau. According to Margaret Trudeau's memoir, at one point, as Pierre Trudeau 
uh, was being spirited away by a throng, he spotted her in the crowd. Recognizing her, he stopped in his tracks and kissed her in front of the press. This was the beginning of a determined and oddly initially secret courtship. They married on March 4th, 1971. Margaret Trudeau, like Wieland, was passionate about sewing. When Pierre Trudeau asked her what she wanted as a wedding gift, a diamond necklace, a ring, he prompted, she said she wanted a sewing machine. And she, ins she installed it in a private room in the attic of 24 Sussex, which she decorated in bright yellow and took refuge there from the pressures of political life to pursue sewing. Margaret Trudeau had strong opinions about Canadian art and its role in their home, as expressed in her autobiography. In 1972, the National Gallery of Canada, which loaned artworks to the Trudeau residents, in, uh, they intended to install A.Y. Jackson and Tom Thompson paintings in the Trudeau dining room. She angrily refused and insisted on having French masterpieces instead. I can't help but point out, well, why would she want those guys when she already has a Joyce Wheeland in the hallway? <laughs> Margaret Trudeau soon realized that being a first lady was not so much to her taste and that many of her values clashed with those of her husband. Rumors of argument of the two abounded, or arguments between the two abounded, and those are revealed further in her biography, which of course is entitled Beyond Reason. And uh, during 1974, she began to doubt her viability or her role as a first lady. She was a rebel in many ways. In fact, she might go down in history as the only first lady who's gone on record about consuming marijuana and peyote mushrooms while her husband was in office. After six years of marriage, they ended their relationship, but uh, before that happened, she took the opportunity to intervene uh, in Whelan's work. Margaret Trudeau's account of this moment demands extensive quotation. <laughs> Quote, one day I did what in Pierre's eyes was the unforgivable. We were having a frosty argument about clothes and suddenly I flew into the most frenzied temper. Now, around this period, she admits to having spent around $10,000 on clothes in one shopping spree with none other than Canadian architect Arthur Erickson. So the argument may have been on that subject. She continues, quote, I tore off up the stairs to the landing where a Canadian quilt designed by Joyce Wheeland and lovingly embroidered by a New York, in a New York loft with Pierre's motto, La raison avant la passion, was hanging. Shaking with rage at my inability to counter his logical reasoned arguments, I grabbed the quilt, wrenched off the letters, and hurled them down the stairs at him one by one in an insane desire to reverse the process, to put passion before reason just this once. <laughs> Pierre was icy, vandalizing an artwork. How far, how low could I sink? All of it seemed beyond reason to me. This seems to have been in 1974. I propose a reading of this intervention as an embodied performance that, beyond realizing the First Lady's fury, is a deep materialization of unhappiness that consummates Whelan's change in faith about Trudeau and the slogan, Reason Over Passion, as well as his aspirations for rationality and their connections to patriarchy. Now, uh, for the sake of time, I am going to only briefly show uh, the project that was an outcome of my research, uh, the artwork that I crafted with a group of 17 women on Fogo Island, Newfoundland, which is a kind of reply uh, to Whelan's piece. So there's an English version as well as a French version. And while crafting this work and working with these women, uh, Joyce Whelan frequently came up and we actually had a lending library, including articles and books related to Whelan and her legacy. So in conclusion, if we consider how uh, Joanne Sloan argues, quote, Whelan set into motion a process by which the attributes of nation nationhood could be continually unmade and remade, we can see in turn that Margaret Trudeau was invested in unmaking and refashioning her then husband's political message and that the quilters on Fogo Island are now invested in a similar program of undoing and negotiating Trudeau's slogan. Thank you. <laughs>